particular, Albert Parsons, who was, uh, who was before the movement was a conservative who fought for the Confederate Army. He was, a conf he was a cavalry officer, a colonel in the Confederate Army. But after the Civil War was over, he decided he had had it with, uh, with fighting for the oppressors and decided to fight for the oppressed. He joined the workers' movement, he joined the anarchist uh, syndicalist movement, and he married a black woman from Texas, with unthinkable in the time of the Confederacy. But he married a black woman named Lucy Parsons, he was executed on May Day, on, not on May Day, he was executed in uh, 1887, but, uh, but his wife continued to fight for the struggle, Lucy Parsons. She made one speech on May Day in 1934, where she, uh, she addressed a crowd of workers and said, uh, this is, imagine this old woman, this is almost 60 years after her husband was killed, doddering old woman goes up to the podium and tells a crowd of, of hundreds of thousands of workers, she says, I, I want every able-bodied working man to position himself in front of the homes of the wealthy and arm themselves with a knife or a gun. And when the wealthy emerge from their houses, shoot or stab them at their earliest possible convenience. This is the spirit of Lucy Parsons as a, as a 94-year-old woman as she stood before a crowd and advocated that. But I also want to remember the, the comrade before me mentioned a lot of great details in the history of the struggle of May Day. There's one I want to mention that, I, that always moves me the most is, uh, is the struggle in the Warsaw Ghetto. In 1943, the, uh, the Jewish ghetto in Warsaw, the, the Nazis uh, were, were busy slaughtering the Jews, sending them off to the death camps. The Jews, uh, section of the Jews, a resistance faction, decided they weren't going to go quietly to the death camps anymore. And they organized an uprising in the Warsaw Ghetto uh, that was extremely successful. For three days, they kicked the shit out of the SS. The, the most powerful military instrument in the, in the world was destroyed by, by freedom fighters, by penniless Jews fighting with, with uh, bricks and stones and what guns they had stolen from the, from the Germans themselves. The Germans couldn't, couldn't crush the resistance, so instead they had to burn the ghetto to the ground. And as they burned it to the ground, the, the people ran. The only place they could run was into the sewers, the only place that wasn't going to burn, right? And down there in the sewers just happened to be May 1st, just happened to be May Day. And the, uh, the Jewish resistance fighters who huddled there and celebrated what, what, in my opinion, must have been one of the most amazing May Days of all time as they sang the International and they remembered everything we had just been talking about. Remembered that, that there is a better day possible. Remembered that there is a way to fight back against exploitation. Remember that the, the few don't have to run this world of ours. To me, that's the very essence of everything this stands for. And I want to, um, I want to finish up with just a little quote from the Haymarket Martyrs. Um, this is uh, from August Spies, who was one of the one of the four men hanged in Chicago for the uh, for starting the May Day struggle. He said, um, just as they were leading him to be ex, or I think he was actually standing on the gallows when he gave his his uh, final speech. He said. If you think that by hanging us you can stamp out the labor movement, the movement from which the downtrodden millions, the millions who toil in want and misery expect salvation, if this is your opinion, then hang us. Here you will tread upon a spark, but there and there, behind you and in front of you, and everywhere, flames blaze up. It is a subterranean fire. You cannot put it out. So in the name of that subterranean fire, I say happy May Day to you all. Uh, next, we're going to bring up Andy. Andy's from CEJ. He's going to talk about workers' rights and corporate greed. All right, thank you, everybody. Um, my name is Andy Reynolds. I'm an organizer with the Coalition for Economic Justice. I am also a board member of Subversive Theater. Very proud to, to be part of the Subversive Theater Collective. Uh, but the Coalition for Economic Justice, we are a a coalition of local uh, community labor faith groups and we fight for workers rights as well as government and corporate accountability uh, it was just a few years back 2008 when we organized community members and faith leaders to occupy Niagara Square uh, in order to pressure Mayor Brown to meet with us and sanitation workers so that sanitation workers could uh, earn a living wage could receive a living wage under the city's living wage ordinance here Right now, uh, one of the campaigns we're working on is uh, we are focusing on Verizon and corporate greed. Uh, one of the biggest, yes, 
one of the uh, biggest examples of corporate greed in the United States and the world today, uh, the Verizon Corporation. 45,000 union workers right now are without a contract while Verizon makes record profits. And they're demanding that the workers uh, uh, accept lower wages, reduced health benefits and retirement benefits. That ain't right. And so we're organizing two actions, one on May 3rd and one on May 12th. That'll, that'll be fun, nonviolent, direct actions against Verizon and corporate greed. And so, I have the information, I have more flyers here that I'll be passing out, but this is one way that you can stand up to corporate power and corporate greed and to fight for workers' rights and fair wages and family-sustaining wages. So, I hope you'll all join us and uh, stand up to, against corporate greed on May 3rd and May 12th. Thank you. I think a lot of what we're finding is that we're all in the same fight here. Uh, there's a lot of different factions doing different things, but we're all moving towards the same place. And I think it's really important that we come together in places like this to move the whole thing together. Uh, we're all in this together and it, all, it affects all of us together. Um, Cindy, where's Cindy? We're going to bring Cindy up and Cindy's going to talk about income disparity. Yes. Hello. I don't have anything prepared, but I'm going to tell you a few things about why I got involved in Occupy Buffalo, and I'm also with the Western New York Peace Center. I saw saw a lot of income disparity going on, both at, in my family and, uh, well, mostly in my family, where we have part of the 1% and part of the 99%. The 1%, part of the 1% in my family is, is on our side, thinks that we should have more equity in income, thinks that we should get better benefits and better incomes across the board. And the rest, well, uh, and then the 99%. So I first went to Washington, D.C., and then when I came home, Occupy Buffalo had started up, and I was very happy. So we started that, and I started joining in with them. I did not camp because I can't do that. I, I admire them for being able to do that. But I'm out here as much as I can get out here to support Occupy Buffalo and what they stand for. One of the things that concerns me a lot are these issues on this, on this sign. I see our democracy eroding. I see the middle class eroding. What's that got to do with anything? Why is that relevant? Should we make the county workers have fewer days off? Is that going to help the rest of us? I am a union member, and I've been in the private sector too. My goal is to raise everybody's income, to raise everybody's freedom, not bring anybody down. And that's, that's where we're going to get to. By pitting one worker against another worker, they're going, they could win. I don't want that to happen. Don't get influenced by that. Channel 4 was wrong. I called them up and I told them, don't do that. That's not news, and it's not helpful for any of them. And they didn't pay any attention. So we keep seeing things like that happening, where they're put pitting the workers against each other, where they're pressuring employers to lower the wages. Well, I'll tell you how to bring jobs to this, to this country. You don't give money to the billionaires and millionaires. They'll take it and say, thank you very much. You give money to the middle class, you stimulate the middle class, tax breaks to the middle class, they will have money in their pockets to buy the goods and services. The millionaires and billionaires that have the businesses will have to produce more goods and services, and then they'll have to hire people. And that's how you stimulate the economy. It doesn't work the other way around. And that's about all I gotta say. Thank you. Yeah.